Hola, bona tarda. Tenim el plaer de tenir aquesta sessió dins de Cosmópolis, que estarà estructurada de la següent manera. Primer ens presentarem breument, en Filip i jo mateix. Després projectarem el documental That's the Story, que narra amb la veu de Glauber, Premi Nobel 2005, per coherència quàntica, com va viure l'època de Los Álamos, com es va fer, la bomba atòmica. I després, tot seguit, el documental dura 50 minuts i tot seguit, aleshores, iniciem un debat que esperem que recorri una mica tot l'efecte de la mecànica quàntica en el segle XX, des del punt de vista tan filosòfic com polític, com des d'un punt de vista pràctic, el que ens ha portat la mecànica quàntica a les nostres vides. I, fins i tot, reservarem un espai per al final perquè tot el públic que vulgui fer preguntes les pugui fer. En Filip està aprenent català, però encara no sap gaire. I'm joking, I was saying that... I ho mantindrem tot si pot ser en anglès. I em sembla que teniu, qui vulgui pot tenir la traducció, i si alguna persona eventualment li voldrà fer preguntes, ja li traduiré jo mateix el que toqui. D'acord? So, Filip, welcome to Civilization, Barcelona and Civilization. Yes, nice to be in Civilization for once. So, may I ask you to introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Sure, good evening, everyone. Well, I am a science writer. I write about science... But primarily from the point of view, what, I, what I'm interested in is how science interacts with the rest of culture and trying to get across the, the idea that science is, of course, part of culture and it affects the rest of culture and the reverse is true. Culture affects science and I'm interested in that interaction. And um, I guess I, I, I'm here perhaps particularly in this context um, to think about and talk about what's in these two books that I wrote, um, this one a little while ago, which is a history of what happened to German physics during the Third Reich, during the uh, regime of Hitler and during the Second World War, and how the ideology of that uh, government and that regime affected, uh, influenced the way physics was done then. Um, and some of the same characters who appear in here, the German physicists, people like uh, Werner Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, Max Planck, um, and uh, Albert Einstein, some of them are the central players in the development of quantum mechanics, which is what this book, Beyond Weird, is about. And um, this is, I guess what I'm attempting to do in, in this book is to try to change the way that we talk about quantum mechanics. Um, there are some sort of popular notions that you tend to hear pretty much as soon as you start to, um, to explore the subject. And it occurred to me uh, several years ago that some of those notions are misleading, some of them are unhelpful cliches, some of them are plain wrong. And so I'm trying to change the tune and talk about what we, what we can now say about what quantum mechanics means. Thank you. It would be a pleasure discussing you. with you. So let me also say, well, uh, I go in, in English. I'm a theoretical physicist. I, I work in quantum information also in particle physics. Uh, but today I will only let, uh, tell you a little bit about what you will see. It turns out that it's a funny story, okay? Uh, it turns out that we had a workshop and we, we received uh, uh, Roy Glauber, who was 86, and uh, uh, he was very happy in Spain, but uh, he was tired after attending all the lectures in the workshop and I wanted to invite him to, to a drink. And uh, it was a mojito. I said, first mojito of Glauber in his life, and he got very happy and very talkative. And he started to tell us about the history of the Manhattan Project. Turns out that uh, he was the last surviving scientist from the Manhattan Project, the theory division at Los Alamos. So there it was, the last voice of the Manhattan Project. 
And uh, next day, we simply took a camera, a very bad camera, and we recorded his words. And then we contacted uh, the Los Alamos archive, and uh, we got footage to cover his face with images from the time of the Los Alamos project. And you will see uh, this, some of these uh, images were uh, shown for the very first time ever, because they were protected. Uh, they were not allowed to be shown. Uh, please, you will see the last person who really talked uh, in first person from the Manhattan Project. And there are issues about ethics, there are issues about science. You will see that he talks about Feynman, about Bethe, about uh, uh, some of the physicists who are less known, uh, but in the middle, we have the, the moment where they throw the bomb, and the, f the aftermath of the bomb is really special. So I hope uh, you will like it, and uh, when it, it's finished, we will come back here, sit here again, and discuss openly about quantum mechanics. Okay? Let's go. Go that way? Yeah. Hope you like it. Uh, it's the last voice. So, Philip, what do you think? <laughs> what about the Germans? Wow. Well, that's uh, certainly an issue I deal with um, in this book, and uh, it's a question that's so often asked. Um, the question being, really, how close w were the Germans trying to make? an atomic bomb and how close did they get? Because one thing that wasn't mentioned there was that that was, of course, the impetus for the Manhattan Project, the fear that Hitler's scientists really were working on the same thing because nuclear fission itself was discovered in Germany, in Berlin in 1938. And it was very clear to any physicists working on these problems in nuclear physics what the implication of that discovery was, that it, it implied that one could liberate uh, nuclear energy either in a controlled way in a nuclear reactor for nuclear power or in this uncontrolled way as a detonation, as a runaway chain reaction with this destructive power. And straight away the scientists in, in Germany recognized that possibility and they made it known to the uh, German authorities that this was a possibility. And by 1939, there was already a discussion. Um, in fact, there was already a group of scientists formed within Nazi Germany to work on this project um, on what they called the uranium machine. And at first, like the, um, uh, like, like the, uh, the Allied scientists in America, at first there was a lot of work in releasing nuclear energy in a controlled way. And that's what Enrico Fermi did in Chicago. He created the first nuclear, sustained nuclear reaction. Um, uh, so the German scientists were working on that as well, um, but they also knew that there was the potential for a bomb. And they made it very clear and the records are very clear about this during the war in, the in around 1941, 1942. They made it very clear to the German authorities, to people like Goebbels and Albert Speer, that this was a possibility, that a bomb was a possibility. Um, and Werner Heisenberg was put in charge of those efforts. Um, now, Heisenberg was a theorist, uh, and he, his work until that time, and in fact his Nobel Prize, was to do with his work on quantum mechanics. So, and this was a very different area. How to make a bomb was really a, a problem of engineering. The physics was clear enough straight away. It was all a matter of how to engineer the process, as you saw in the, um, in the, Los Alamo, in the Manhattan Project. Um, so the question is how close were the Germans and were they genuinely trying to do this? And it's still disputed. In fact, vigorously, sometimes uh, 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 furiously disputed by, uh, by historians today. 
whether Heisenberg and his colleagues were genuinely trying to make a bomb during the war or you know, whether they, as they later claimed themselves, whether they were purposely dragging their feet. Or at one point, Heisenberg even suggested that he purposely falsified calculations so that the Germans wouldn't get a bomb. And my view from looking at what evidence we have of that is that um, certainly that I, I see no basis in that story, that somehow Heisenberg and the others were actively working to prevent Hitler from getting the bomb. What, what, what seems to me to have happened is that the scientists were trying to do this. It was clear they had a nuclear project that was uh, at first being carried out in Berlin and then it was taken to, um, out when Berlin became too dangerous and it was just being bombed. Mm -hmm. They moved the whole operation uh, down to the south to a secret location where they continued to try to first of all make a nuclear reactor. So they were, they were definitely actively working on this mm -hmm. during that time. And uh, it's not clear. Some people say they just didn't know how to do it. They, did, they, they got it wrong. They, you know, they could have made a bomb, but they just didn't solve the problems. The Heisenberg and his colleagues, in particular his, his uh, associate Karl von Weissacker, um, I, I feel that they were wanting to defend the integrity of German science by dismissing that story, by saying, yes, we knew how to do it all along. Uh, they had a very difficult position to maintain after the war because, you know, they wanted to, to tell people that, of course, the German scientists knew as much as the Allied scientists, if not more, but at the same time to, to tell them that, of course, we weren't actually trying to deliver the bomb into Hitler's hands. So, you know, what exactly was it that they were trying to do? And I think the truth is that they failed to make the case to the German authorities that they could really do this in time to make a difference to the war, and so they didn't get the funding that they needed, and that money instead was invested by the Germans in the rocket project, the V1 and V2 project, um, that got huge funding, and Manhattan Project scale funding. So I think that was really the, the, the problem. They didn't have the resources and the funding because they didn't make the case strongly enough, because th I think they probably doubted that they could really yeah. deliver this in time. There is a special uh, moment in, in that time no? when um, Heisenberg visited uh, Copenhagen to his old professor uh, Niels Bohr. So this is a source of uh, the play that will be uh, uh, played this afternoon, well after the, after the hour the discussion. So the discussion, in a way, is whether what happened in that meeting, because mm. apparently when the documents were released, no, the the story is uh, explained in two different ways by the two people who were in the same room. No, so what what is your yeah. take on that uh, visit of Heisenberg to Bohr? Well, this this happened in 1941, and at that time Denmark was under German occupation. Um, but Niels Bohr was still working there in Copenhagen doing, doing his research as best he could. And Heisenberg came along. And Heisenberg had worked with Niels Bohr in Copenhagen in the 1920s and had done his groundbreaking work, absolutely pivotal work, on quantum mechanics in 1925-26 was when Heisenberg came up with his famous uncertainty principle. And he was working with Bohr then. And together, they developed a kind of picture of what quantum mechanics was and what it was telling us. So they had a very close relationship at that time. So what was Heisenberg wanting to do, returning to his mentor, really, in 1941, when his mentor was uh, you know, a, 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 um, a, a citizen of an occupied territory? Um, and Heisenberg seemed to have walked in um, sort of expecting things to be normal and expecting to just have a conversation about, about science with Bohr um, in a very, I mean, I, I think everyone is greed, regardless of what else you think of Heisenberg's character, that he was arrogant. Yeah. Um, and they had this discussion, um, and it, afterwards, Bohr and Heisenberg told quite different stories about what it was about. Um, it, it seems to me that Heisenberg didn't exactly know himself what it was he was wanting to do, except that I think he was clearly 
somewhat tortured by the possibilities that he s foresaw in nuclear uh, research and that he was actually in charge of now in, in Germany. And so he was, some feel that he was seeking some kind of endorsement from his mentor that, you know, that what he was doing was okay. Um, others say that he was trying to find out what, um, uh, what Bohr knew about the Allied work in this area. Um, others say that he was trying to signal to Bohr that actually they weren't going to make a bomb and they weren't close to this. And so, you know, there was no need to worry. Um, and, I mean, you know, the truth is we'll never know. But um, afterwards, Heisenberg gave the impression that he was trying to warn Bohr um, you know, that this was a possibility, that bombs were a possibility, as if Bohr didn't already recognize that. Um, and Bohr, who was generally a very mild-mannered person, when he saw the accounts that Heisenberg gave after the war, he was incensed, mm -hmm. and he wrote a letter to Heisenberg, and then he rewrote it, and then he rewrote it again, and this is, Bohr, this is what mm -hmm. Bohr used to do. He would write and write and write. He would do the same with his scientific papers, and he never actually sent the letter at all. And it, the interesting thing is that when Michael Frayn revisited this meeting um, in his play in, um, uh, in, in uh, 1990, I guess it was 1998, I think the original play came out, um, that the discussion that it, that it created um, prompted the Niels Bohr Institute to, to release, release those letters in 2002, which were really interesting documents about Bohr's position on, on that meeting. So we have two very different accounts, and the brilliant thing that Michael Frayn has done um, in his play is to really dramatize that and to build that around the whole idea that Heisenberg introduced of uncertainty, of not being able to know, you know, uh, all that you might in principle want to know or you, you could know about a situation. I mean, this is kind of loosely speaking what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says about quantum mechanical systems. And, Hi and Frayn uses this as the sort of setting to, 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 to look at what went on. But it's interesting, I've spoken to, to Michael uh, about this, uh, you know, as a result of writing this book. And I, I think I'm representing him fairly in saying that he would write it somewhat differently now, yeah. now that we know more about yeah. that interaction. Okay. So before moving to quantum mechanics as a theory, uh, there is a final thing, uh, I, I think not many people know that all the German scientists were put together after the war for a short time in England. Could you tell a little bit about the yeah? Well, it was barn a, fault? about right. Well, well, you see, as the war was reaching its end game, um, the German scientists were, were still in Germany, and they had they. It was very clear that they had a, a wealth of knowledge about nuclear technology and about physics generally, and so. Um, you know, at that stage, it was kind of a race between the Russians and the Americans as to who could round up scientists more quickly and get hold of them and take them to the east or west. Um, and so the, 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 uh, the Allies and the Americans in particular, first of all, reached where the nuclear research was being done in southern Germany, rounded up as many of the scientists as they could. It was a project called Project Alsos. Um, to, you know, basically grab them and bring them to the West. And so most of the s German scientists working on that project were taken, no one quite knew what to do with them once they got them, but they would take, so the British said, well, we'll take them, we'll have them for a bit. And so they took them to Cambridge, um, to outside of uh, Cambridge, and held them in a, a, an old um, sort of farmhouse, really, called Farm Hall. It was a sort of stately home. And they kept them there um, while they figured out what to do with them. But they had the brilliant idea that they would bug this place so that they would listen to the German scientists uh, to see what they knew and what they had been doing um, during that time. And the Germans, um, I mean, Heisenberg in particular, again, in this arrogant fashion, he sort of said, uh, one of his colleagues said, they might be listening to us, this place might be bugged. And he said, don't be silly, they, <laughs> the British would never think of doing something like that. So th we th ended up with this, uh, these conversations between the German scientists that were completely uninhibited because they thought they weren't being listened to um, about what went on. And they're absolutely fascinating listening, um, particularly when, because they were still at Farm Hall when the bombs were dropped 
on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so we hear their response to those accounts that were announced on the radio. And to begin with, they simply didn't believe they them. Didn't believe Heisenberg them. said this has to be some sort of hoax. He couldn't believe that anyone <laughs> other than himself <laughs> could have got further along the, you know, uh, down the line of actually making a bomb and using it. Gradually, they realized, you know, this had to be true. And so then they started saying to each other, why didn't we do this? You know, what, what, how did we fail? And, and, and Heisenberg got into arguments about you know, whether they really understood how to make a bomb or not. So these farm hall transcripts are you know, incredibly valuable pieces of uh, information, archives, not just about what the Germans were actually doing, but about how they felt about it. You know, were they really trying to make a bomb? Um, so I talk about that in yeah. here as well. OK, well, let, let's move to something different. Well, it's clear now that quantum mechanics has changed the politics of, of the 20th century, the geopolitics. Uh, science, in particular, moved from Germany to North America. And uh, it's also trigger quantum mechanics application trigger the appearance of lasers, of new ways of communicating, computers, semiconductors. It changed our lives. Okay, dramatically. You have written many, well, you have written books about uh, uh, popularization of, of science, in particular of quantum mechanics. No? Could you say in, in a few sentences what is quantum mechanics? <laughs> a few sentences. Um, they always ask me that. <laughs> so for one time, let me ask you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, quantum mechanics <laughs> is a, a theory. Um, it's, it's a mathematical theory that scientists use every day, in particular to try to understand and to predict how matter, how particles behave, and also how light behaves, at the very smallest scale, at the scales of the atom. And th at that scale, things seem to behave in very different ways to the ways that we're used to in everyday life at this scale. Um, what seem to be very strange things happen, very strange properties uh, come about. Quantum mechanics is the theory that, um, th that we use to, to make predictions about that. And it works fine. In fact, it works probably finer than any other scientific theory we know about. It is incredibly accurate, and it is what is used to build all the devices that you know, are projecting this, and our laptops and our phones ultimately rely on an understanding of quantum mechanics. Um, so we know this is a theory that works. It's incredibly successful. Um, the, the, the problem with quantum mechanics is that we don't quite agree on what it means, what it tells us about the fundamental nature of the world, what those particles are like. And the, the difficulty comes, um, it, well, it comes in, in, in many ways, uh, but perhaps the, 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 the best way to see this is that it appears that what happens, or what we see happen in quantum mechanical systems, particles moving and, and interacting with one another, what we see seems to have some dependence on how we look and what questions we ask. And this is so different to what science leads us to believe. We expect science to tell us objectively about a world out there and give us answers about what will happen. And this fact that somehow the observer seems to have some influence on that is deeply unsettling, and it deeply unsettled people like Heisenberg and Einstein and Bohr when it, this became apparent in the 1920s and 1930s. And the arguments for what that means and who, if any of them, were right at that time, those arguments are still going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let me give you an example to the audience, okay, that why quantum mechanics is so crazy. Okay. So I, I take uh, the usual example of why I see there is a bottle of water here. Okay. So the process which is taking place is that there is light from this bulb that comes here, bounces, and goes to my eye, and my eye processes the signal. But in a way, there has been a collision, okay? From the particle of light, call it a photon, it hit the bottle, came back to my eye. So, and the bottle is there. But if that bottle were an electron, 
when the light bounces back from the electron, the electron is uh, expelled towards infinity, okay? So when I receive my, my light in my eye, what can I say? There is no electron there. So I'm receiving a partial information. I don't know where the electron is. So when we go to the realm of the atom, there is a limitation to know. So what is reality? What is knowledge? What do we understand? What can we understand? Is there a limit to the way humans can describe nature? So what is the most, for you, the most subtle piece of quantum mechanics? <laughs> what, you know, why, why, why so mysterious? Or what, what, what is more shocking to you about quantum mechanics? Well, maybe the, uh, the definitive um, phenomenon or experiment in quantum mechanics. I mean, people often talk about the so-called double slit experiment, um, which I won't talk about because I think that we, 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 there's something more, more sort of fundamental, more shocking than that. And in fact, it was, um, it, it's a phenomenon that was first pointed out by Einstein in um, 1935 and which straight away another of the, uh, the, the founders of quantum mechanics who I haven't, we haven't yet heard about, Erwin Schrodinger, um, straight away said this phenomenon is really what the heart of quantum mechanics is about. And it's a phenomenon that's become known as entanglement. And what it seems to imply is that when two quantum particles have interacted in some way, after that, they are somehow interdependent. And if they interact and then go their separate ways, no matter how far apart they go, there is an interdependence of them. And you can see that interdependence um, in the way that if you, you can set up an experiment where if you observe one of those particles to find out what state it is in, what one of its properties is like, let's say, um, then you can show that that act of observing that particle seems to have an instant influence on the other particle that it's entangled with, no matter how far away it is. And that, that, that if, if influence seems to be instantaneous. And this is what really troubled Einstein, because in his theory of relativity, of special relativity, it's, it, that seemed to suggest that this instant action at a distance should be impossible, because no signal, no influence can travel faster than light. Um, so even if somehow what you did here was affecting what was over here, there should be a time delay before you see it. But there are experiments that can be done that show very clearly that there is this interdependence and there is no time delay. Um, now, it's a very, the reason it's very subtle is that people immediately say, well, then how is it, how is this influencing that? Um, and Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. And uh, we know that, that, that this, this kind of uh, interdependence happens, but we can also now say that it's not, I think, spooky action at a distance, because we know there is, we cannot talk about somehow an influence here being transmitted over here. That's not the right way to look at this picture. It seems better to me, to my mind, to say that once those two particles are entangled, in some sense, as far as quantum mechanics is concerned, they're the same object. They're in different parts of space, but they're the same object. And so quantum mechanics in this way seems to sort of make a mockery of our normal concepts of what space is and what it means for two things to be separated in space. It's as though entanglement doesn't recognize space and what space is meant to do. So it's a, this is a very subtle but absolutely crucial aspect of quantum mechanics, and it's one that we're now making use of. Well, let me say that now... Uh, distribution of entanglement has been achieved over 100 kilometers, and the Chinese new satellite MISIUS is trying now to has achieved partial entanglement at 1,200 kilometers of the distance of the Earth, but now the new experiment will go at 7,000 kilometers, uh, distributing entanglement between Heifei in China and uh, Austria. Okay, but may I? Let's discuss a little bit. <laughs> I think there is something which is overemphasized in this discussion of entanglement. I will give you another example. So I'm 
Every morning when I dress, I have a drawer, and I got my socks, and they are mixed up. And every morning, I get a red one and a blue one, because I'm from Barca, you know, from red and blue. And, uh, but it's International Mixed Socks Day today, actually. <laughs> Do you know it really is? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, so, but I, I, I'm random. I put sometimes my red on the right uh, foot, sometimes on the other. Okay, but you know that I will take a red and a blue. You know that. But you don't see whether it's on my right foot or on my left foot. So, what is your understanding of that? Well, you give probability one half to this, probability one half to this, no? To, that it is on the right or on the left. That's what you do. Now, suddenly I do like that, and you see red. So you say automatically that the other one is blue. And you don't call that a spooky action of, at a distance. Nobody does that. You don't think that uh, you are violating causality, you are doing anything. Simply, you have not enough information, and then by your measurement, you project your uncertainty into, into something which is certain. That happens in classical physics, in, in normal logic. But by some reason I don't quite understand, it is overemphasized in quantum mechanics. You may discuss that the relation to probabilities is the Born rule and the square, but the fact that if you don't have information, you have to maintain both possibilities, and suddenly when you learn one, the other is fixed. That happens in classical physics. Well, anyway, it, this is my own discussion, because very often I could be more technical and tell you that if Alice and Bob measure, Alice gets a pro, uh, pure state uh, where at the same time Alice has a density matrix. This is mathematical, but I, mean, I, I never understood why people are... I understand that because Einstein had this, this idea. Was that? But let me uh, ask you about the other thing. Quantum mechanics has changed philosophy. Okay, philosophers changed the way they were doing philosophy in the first quarter of the century. I mean, it's completely different. Natural philosophy changed dramatically. And there is one thing that I think which is very profound, which is that Quantum mechanics says that when you measure, the result of the measurement has some randomness, inherent randomness. And this, for me, this is extremely profound. There is randomness, and there is none in classical physics. That, that's philosophically a dramatic statement for me. You know, it's a fact. You know, it, in classical physics, it, it is written the day you will die, the, whether you will laugh, it, everything is written according to the laws of classical physics. But quantum mechanics breaks that uh, paradigm. So for me, no, uh, the, 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 the most aggressive postulate of quantum mechanics is the introduction of randomness. I, well, I think those two things that you've just mentioned are related, you see, and this is why entanglement poses such a puzzle that socks don't. Um, be, it, it is because of randomness, because um, according to quantum mechanics, um, if you have these two particles, and let's say they're, you know, we, one is red and one is blue, and we know that there is this relationship, that one is going to be red and one is going to be blue, um, that you can create the situation where you know that there's this relation between them, that they're correlated in that way, but quantum mechanics cannot tell you which of them is going to be red and which is going to be blue. And it's not just that we don't know which it is. Oops. Quantum mechanics tells you that which of those it is is not determined until you look. That is the only way we can think about it, which is different from your socks. You know, it, that while they're hidden by your, 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 your trousers, we know that one is already red and one is already blue. Um, but in quantum mechanics, with these entangled particles, there is genuine randomness. As far as we can tell, there is randomness in what we're going to see when we make that measurement on one of them, whether it's going to be red or blue. There is no way we can say until we make that measurement. It's as if, and I think we have to say as if, making the measurement produces that result. Reality. No? Okay, yes. So that's really the difference, and that's why it's so strange that how does this one know what has been, if you like, decided over here? How does it know straight away that it has to be blue if this is measured as red? So, it, you know, that's where the randomness comes in, that there are situations, you know, very often, in fact, it's the norm in quantum mechanics that we cannot say what result we will get 
All quantum mechanics, all the mathematics tells you is the probabilities of finding the different possible results of the system. So in this case, it's possible that the particle is blue, it's possible that it's red. And we can set it up so that there's a 50-50 probability of each. That is all quantum mechanics tells you. And the real question then, the philosophical one, is um, is that where reality has to stop? You know, it seems crazy, and it seemed crazy to Einstein to say, that's all we can say. Not just because we don't know, but because no answer exists about whether it's red or blue until we have asked the question. And, you know, so I think you're absolutely right. I think that aspect of quantum mechanics is deeply unsettling because it says to us that there are some <laughs> questions that we can meaningfully ask and get answers to, and yet, until we have asked the question and made the observation, no reality, no answer exists. Yeah. Just to complete, uh, probably you have listened to this famous sentence by Einstein that says, God does not play dice with the atom. So Einstein was deeply against the idea that there is inherent randomness in nature, okay? He was a deterministic guy. Uh, she's a mess, huh? determinism is for another discussion. That's a real mess. But let me also, we are discussing how quantum mechanics has changed our century, the past century, 20th century. And uh, uh, I, we discuss the politics through the movie. We discuss uh, now the philosophy, our understanding of nature. But many people may, may love to know that their lives, the everyday life, is full of quantum mechanics. No? So maybe we could tell a little bit of the things that which are near you, which are quantum mechanical, and speculate a little bit towards the future. What, mm -hmm. is, what will come to you from quantum mechanics in the future, okay? Is that okay? Yeah. So I start yeah, with yeah. one thing, one thing, lasers. Huh? That's light, these particles are incoherent. They all go randomly. They don't talk to each other. We have managed to get these particles of light to be on the very same what we call wave, func wave function state in a coherent way, and that's a laser. And with the laser, we do communications. Our phone, okay, communicates with optical fibers, and they go with lasers. You can correct your eye with a laser. You can read the DVD with a laser. You can cut iron with a laser. So there are more lasers on Earth than humans, by far, okay? So it turns out that this is quantum mechanical, and really nobody knows. <laughs> I mean, that, uh, they think that you know, your point with a pointer is a laser, and everything is given for, uh, as a triviality, and man, this is not trivial, yeah, constructing a laser. I don't know what is for you, I mean, what could we say that is quantum mechanical in origin? Yeah, well, and lasers were predicted, by the way, by Einstein in the 1930s, yeah. so it took another, what, 30, 40 years before we could yeah. actually make them. Um, but uh, no, it's absolutely true that, um, you know, these questions of um, how we interpret quantum mechanics, they used to seem very exotic and esoteric and only a few people were interested in them. And in fact, until maybe the 1980s uh, at the earliest, um, anyone who was taking an interest in these questions was risking their career. It was considered disreputable to be, you know, worrying about um, what quantum mechanics really meant. You just were meant to get on with the job. Um, whereas these days, um, that, I think it's a very good thing that that has changed, and partly it's changed because we can do experiments, the mm -hmm. experiments on entanglement, for example, that used to be just thought experiments. It was just a thought experiment when Einstein came up with it in 1935. Um, uh, but we, we can go even further than that because we can use these phenomena like entanglement and like so-called superposition where you can, it's a very simple thing, it's, uh, uh, where, uh, that's really what uh, entanglement is a kind of superposition um, where it, you could think of it as being a sort of superposition of a blue and red and a, a red and blue particle, um, okay. And um, w th these quantum phenomena are now being used um, so Jose talked about the, this um, experiment 
using satellites, broadcasting quantum information across the planet using satellites over thousands of kilometers, um, maintaining an entangled state in these particles. And the reason for doing that, uh, the reason why one would want to do that, is that while they are in an entangled state, you can encode information into these particles, let's say into the colors of the particles to represent binary digits. You can encode information into them that cannot be read out by any other eavesdropper without that being detected. So it's, very, very secure. it's a very, very secure way of sending information over long distances um, without it being intercepted and, and read. And that's why people are developing these quantum communication systems and what people are now talking about is a quantum internet um, to send information very securely this way. And the other way that it's starting to be applied, one other way, one other big way, is in quantum computers, which many people will have heard of as these, they're often sort of sold as these super powerful devices that are going to replace our laptops and do, you know, many more calculations a second. It's not clear if that will really happen, but certainly real quantum computers exist that make use of these quantum properties and that are going to be used increasingly over the next decade mm -hmm. and, or two in ways that will affect our lives. Be, they'll be used to do calculations for things like drug discovery, for example. Um, so they will start to have an impact on our lives. Yeah. Let, uh, I think this is so relevant that let me add a little bit here. Uh, you know, we have computers. We have phone. Can't use the phone, no? The phone, the phone has seven antennas, has uh, processors. It communicates with GPS, you read the GPS, there are satellites that have atomic clocks there with an extreme precision of one part in 10 to the 13. So it's a miracle, no? Phone, it's a miracle. But still, the transistor here is using quantum mechanical properties in a very coarse way, not a refined way. We are not putting information on single atoms. We are using currents that go, and they use some quantum mechanical effect. So the quantum computation Philip is uh, talking about is really the idea that we will encode information at the level of atoms, of ions, and we can process in an amazing new way information. So we are building quantum computers, and these quantum computers may help uh, in drugs. As you see, you may have this effect that Nowadays, we, we find drugs by trial and error, whereas we open the possibility of computing drugs for the first time in this 21st century. It's really a jump, okay? But uh, I have a feeling I want to share with you that the uh, race for building the quantum computer, it's an enormous effort going on in America, in China, in Europe. There is a flagship in Europe, which is an amazing amount of money for that is producing a new... We are repeating the, the prior of the atomic bomb. No? We are building an uh, amazing instrument that may, mis may be misused by humans. No? Do you think there is an ethical issue to be discussed about quantum computation? Um, no more so than any other powerful technology, I guess. Um, because as far as we can see at the moment, quantum computers may allow us to do some classes of calculation, by no means every calculation, but some certain types of calculation, much faster than we can at the moment. It's particularly good at doing things like searching for, uh, you know, searching for, for, for an answer among many possible answers. Um, so, you know, this is why, this is one reason why it might be useful for things like drug discovery, because you can do, you can simulate um, molecules very, very quickly using quantum computers in principle. So we're finding ways of doing that. So, you know, it, it, it can help us to find answers to questions much more quickly. And at the moment, you know, we, we, we have some good idea of some of the questions we would like to use quantum computers for. Um, but they're existing questions and they're, and they're understood. And um, so, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily see that an increase in computing power by using quantum mechanics is going to have any more, any different ethical implications to 
the advances in computation more generally. Um, and that's not to dismiss the question entirely, because in fact, I think the development of Com computer of computer technology generally has received far too little ethical inquiry. Um, it was done very glibly, and we can see, you know, we're seeing the consequences of it now in the way that um, our, you know, the, the internet and social media and so on pose new threats to democracy. Um, and, you know, I think there has been far too little serious foresight given to the effects of this sort of computational capacity um, in our society. So, uh, for sure, mm -hmm. quantum computers will exacerbate those questions, but I don't know that they will introduce new questions. Well, my prediction is that the combination of quantum computation and artificial intelligence, something big. We are not prepared for that. As a society, that's my feeling, okay? I think this is coming too fast. And, uh, so maybe uh, we would very much appreciate questions from the audience. Would anybody? Please. Are there, are there microphones or should you just <laughs> shout it out? Or stand up and... Crida, oh my crida, yes. Great, yes, thank you. Um, so the question was, th there, there are many different interpretations of what quantum mechanics means that have been put forward, and the question was, which of them <laughs> do I subscribe to? Um, and will we ever know which of them is, is, is right? And um, I, I'm, not a, um, I'm not firmly in any camp. Um, but that doesn't mean to say I think they're all as good as one another. I think that there are some interpretations that I'm extremely skeptical about, and perhaps most of all, the one that is often the one that you popularly hear about, which is called the many worlds interpretation, um, which, su which, Im which suggests that um, w we have the situation where in a quantum experiment there are various possible outcomes and when we do the measurement, we actually we just find one of them. Uh, but before we do the measurement, you know, all seem possible with different probabilities. The many worlds interpretation says actually all of those uh, outcomes are realized. They're just realized in different universes. As you make the split, the universe somehow splits, including the experimenter and everything else eventually. And so there are just innumerable universes where all these different possible, possible outcomes of quantum phenomena are realized. And I think that, I mean, it sounds, it sounds crazy and it sounds extravagant, but it's not so easily dismissed as that. But I think that there are profound problems if you really take that seriously. So I don't like that one, I have to say. The, um, What's often said as the, what's often put forward as a standard view of quantum mechanics, even though there's no consensus for any of them, is called the Copenhagen interpretation because it was developed by Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and their collaborators. And to put it crudely, it, it, it says, and I, I do apologize to people who know the less crude version, but to put it crudely, it, 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 it's kind of saying um, all we can meaningfully say when we, do an, when we do a quantum experiment, all we can meaningfully say is what we observe. The question of what, this, what, you know, what was, state was this particle in before I looked at it, that question doesn't have any meaning. Doesn't have any meaning that we can address. Um, and you can understand that to a lot of people that feels like giving up. It feels like, you know, how, how can we simply resign ourselves to there not being some Re physical reality until we look at it. Einstein criticized this point of view by saying, Are you, do you mean to tell me that the moon isn't there until I look at it? Um, and I, th there, there's a bit of a, a, a sort of fashion, I think, at the moment for knocking the Copenhagen interpretation and saying it's just a cop-out and we've got to get beyond this. And I understand those reasons and I'm, I'm not, I don't think the Copenhagen interpretation in those terms can be all there is to say. However, what I do like about it is that it tells us where, we, where our certainty has to stop. 
So, uh, you know, I think that one of the things, one of the useful things it tells us is that as far as we know at the moment, um, asking which path a particle took before we looked at it isn't something that we can uh, meaningfully respond to. Maybe we'll be able to do better. Maybe we'll be able to develop some way of talking about what is happening before we look. I don't rule that out, but I think that it's important to make that distinction. And it's why, for example, when we talk about superpositions, I always try to not to say what most people often do say about a particle and a superposition. It's in two states at once, or it's in two places at once. It is not, because we, we don't know what it, what, what it is until we look. And what I do at the end of uh, my book is to suggest that what we need for quantum mechanics, at the moment at least, is not an is language where we say, you know, what is the path of the electron? What is the state of this particle? But an if language. That's what quantum mechanics seems to me to be telling us. It says to us, if we look, and if we look in this manner and not this manner, then we will see this with this probability, or this with this probability. We need if questions rather than is answers in quantum mechanics. So that's the best I can do for the position I have at the moment. Whether we will ever know the, the truth is very, very hard to know because all these interpretations of quantum mechanics have to be consistent with what we see experimentally. If they're not, then they must be wrong. So this is the problem, finding experiments that can actually rule between these different interpretations of quantum mechanics is extremely difficult, if not impossible, at the moment. But that's what we're going to have to find a way of doing if we're ever going to get to grips with what's really going on. You know, interpretation yeah. means that the equations are the same. So how can't you rule out an interpretation? It's, it's the same as saying, look, this, this poem, I have my interpretation, but you have another one. Who can dismiss any, others, any other people's interpretation, I think? Uh, that's why we have this saying in, in practitioners that said, shut up and compute, no? Because that's, uh, <laughs> that's a famous saying. But I, I think that it's still, I, I, I delight in the fact that people argue about yeah, interpretation. Yeah, sure. I think it's a good thing, actually, even <laughs> if it you know, is often <laughs> comes down to philosophy yeah. and personal opinion rather than things yeah, you can yeah, test yeah. and experiment. No, I agree, but I think yeah. it's good. But there are these, people go very far in yes. interpretations. Right. There was another question. Yeah. I've got the, the microphone. Um, this is a question also for Philip. Um, so when you say that you prefer to interpret the Copenhagen interpretation as if um, mainly in terms of when you make a measurement, either something happens or something else, that puts the observer in a very central place, right? So that seems to, at least to my, in, my, uh, in my mind, give the humans or whoever is performing experiments a strange role as creating um, reality or something. Do you agree with that? Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I would absolutely say that is exactly the problem that we have to grapple with because it really doesn't feel right, does it? That somehow we're, um, we're influencing you know, what is there, what is real. And um, so I completely understand that that's the, 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 the concern. Um, the way at the moment I like to think about that is to suggest that what, what seems to be happening is that the, the, the problem may be that there are more questions we can ask about the observable universe than the universe has a capacity for giving answers to. And the, the, the way, the, 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 the most useful way I've heard for thinking about this, for thinking about the role of the observer that doesn't sound somehow mystical, is one that was suggested by the American physicist John Wheeler. And it's a version of the game of 20 questions, which you, you probably know, where you know, you're, normally you play it that uh, someone goes out of the room and everyone else thinks of a famous person. And then the person comes back in and starts asking questions. To fit, and they have to be yes, no questions. So they're quantum questions. There are just two possible answers to figure out who this person is. And Wheeler said, quantum mechanics is like that game, only with a difference. And it goes like this, that the person comes back in and starts asking questions. 
is it a male? Yes, says the first answerer. Um, and then she asks the next one, is he alive? No. Okay, and uh, so it goes on. But she finds that as the, she goes on and, and asks more and more questions, it takes the person who's answering longer and longer to answer, which seems weird because it's just a yes or no answer, right? So why should it be something you have to think about? Anyway, she carries on, and eventually she thinks she's getting there, and she's, she's zeroing in on the answer, and eventually she says, I've got it, it's Richard Feynman. And everyone says, yes, it's Richard Feynman, and they all laugh. And then she says, what was going on? Why were you taking so long to answer my questions? And they explained to her that they played the game a bit differently. What they had agreed to do when she was out of the room was not to think of a person, but to agree that whatever answer the next person gave, it was going to be consistent with all the previous answers that had been given in terms of applying to at least someone <laughs> famous who they could think of. So as soon as the first person had said uh, yes to, you know, is it male, then everyone subsequently had to, that they had to have in their mind someone who was male and who, you know, fitted all the other questions. So it became harder and harder to think, you know, who, who's going to fit all the answers that have been given so far? Um, and eventually, you, you zero in by asking the questions, you zero in on an answer. But unt w until the questions were asked, there is no answer. If the person had come back in and just said, oh, I can't be bothered to play this game, just tell me who you thought of, they couldn't do it because they hadn't thought of anyone. It was only by asking the questions that the answers came about. Um, and the quantum mechanics at the moment, at least, seems to be a game a bit like that. Um, and so there you, we see that you know, it, the observers, the person who's asking the questions, by asking the questions, you, 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 you get to the answer. But not in some sort of weird way that is um, determining reality. It's, it's kind of the, the, the nature of the questions themselves if you like, forces the universe to zero in on a particular answer, okay? And all the other answers were possible. So, uh, th you know, that is a way that I, I think removes the idea of the questioner as having some weird power of determining what the universe is like, but nevertheless is um, forcing the, the sort of information in the system to give pati a, a particular answer in the end. It may not be a, a helpful <laughs> way to, for you to think about it, but it makes sense to me, um, and particularly if we think of quantum mechanics in terms of uh, a theory about what can and cannot be said about the states that the universe has. I think that's the, that's the best way at the moment I, I, I have of saying what sort of theory quantum mechanics is. It's a, it's a, 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 it seems to be a theory about what we can and cannot, what we, are, what we are and are not entitled to say about the universe. And that's the way John Wheeler put it too. We are getting late. May I add that there are recent experiments trying to see the difference between the macroscopic and microscopic world because in quantum mechanics you have the observer as a macroscopic guy and uh, the macroscopic world separate and uh, the new experiments are really amazing because everything seems to go into the direction that everything is unitary and there is no collapse and things like that but uh, in my, my opinion is that we are living just in the 21st century we have a partial understanding of nature Quantum mechanics is an effective theory, it works. Well, time will come that everything will be refined in extreme and we will have a much better understanding. We will not be there, so that's a pity. We, we well, well, maybe may you not will be there. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think it, it, people say it could well be 50 years, another 50 years and we're still arguing about these things. Yeah, I think so. so. They ask us, uh, oh, very final question, there was somebody pointing. Very fast answer also. Okay. I'll try. Hi. Oh, it seems to be on. Uh, yeah, very briefly. So thank you for blowing our minds away this afternoon. <laughs> A pleasure. <laughs> uh, this is what we came for. No, uh, just kidding. But um, my answer, uh, so my, my question goes, because the first time I read about in the interdependence, it was not in a physics environment, but it was reading Buddhist 
uh, text. Mm -hmm. And my my question goes basically to to uh, yeah to, to share with you. To what extent are you familiar about uh, these Buddhist observations about nature and about um, alternative universes and and so on? Because apparently there's some convergence between your theories in the 21st century and what Buddha said like 4,000 years ago. And I would appreciate your opinion on that. Thank you. Um, the, the, uh, ex the phenomena that I've talked about are, and I, I always w sort of want to stress this in talking about quantum mechanics, that we, we see them in the laboratory under very, very well-defined and closely controlled circumstances, in, you know, in very specialized experiments. And what we see, and, and in fact, what Jose has just sort of alluded to, really, is that in our everyday world, we lose those quantum effects very, very quickly. This phenomenon of, of entanglement uh, disappears. It gets, um, it, it, it's a process called decoherence, and it, it's as though the, the, the sort of um, the quantum properties, the sort of quantum coherence of the waves, um, once you get to the scale of objects like this, it just disappears in an incredibly short time. It's actually a physical process, and we can see it happening in some experiments, but for that reason, we know that it happens almost instantaneously. So the idea that entanglement might have some influence, let's say, on how the mind works or you know, how the body works or how consciousness works is very, very hard to, um, to sustain given what we know about entanglement and how, if you like, how fragile it is, how rapidly it dissipates um, in, in the universe. That said, I think it is interesting that um, th th there are these parallels with, you know, o o older methods, uh, o older systems of thought. Um, it, it, and I, I think what, it, what quantum mechanics doesn't seem to mean is that somehow, let's say, my mind here can influence someone else's mind over there. I think that, you know, the, the, the decoherence makes it very clear that there's no real way we can see that happening. However, at the, at the most fundamental level of you know, what reality consists of, what, what is really down there? Is it something that's just hard and tangible and absolute? Or you know, is there some way in which we bring things into existence, which is how John Wheeler talked about it, certainly. He talked about a participatory universe. I think that if we are very careful in the way we talk about it, then I see no harm in thinking about whether there are parallels between that and other systems of thought. But we do have to understand that when we're talking about quantum phenomena like this, they are very, very well-defined, very mathematically well-defined, and really difficult to see. And we have to do very controlled experiments to see them. So we have to be careful about not making quantum mechanics an explanation for anything that we can't explain in any other way. Myself, I cannot answer this too. <laughs> I, I, I've read the Mahabharata little piece, the Bhagavad Gita. So as many of us, as, I, I am very interested in all these different ways of understanding nature because I want to understand nature, but the, the question escapes my understanding. I so mean, I cannot one thing uh, that it's always, I always think it's good to bear in mind, uh, a, a person who we haven't heard about, another foundational uh, person in the history of quantum mechanics, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, um, was one of the most hard-headed, hard-nosed physicists going, incredibly incisive and critical of, 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 of other physicists and would dismiss ideas out of hand. Um, and yet, he held really quite mystical views mm -hmm. about um, some aspects of quantum mechanics. And he, was, he corresponded with Carl Jung and was very interested in Jung's mm -hmm. ideas. And I guess I sort of feel like, well, if someone like Pauli is prepared to, to <laughs> you know, keep an open mind about some things, maybe we should too. That's science. Keep yeah. your mind open. Be ready to change your understanding, Absolutely. to improve. If you're not ready, if, you, if you're hidden behind prejudices, you are not a scientist. Okay. Well, uh, may I, I will close in Catalan? Is that okay? We, uh, okay. Yes, of course, yes. Bueno, pues ya okay. ens hem arribat fins a les dues hores, no? I uh, us volia agrair, òbviament, molt que estigueu aquí amb nosaltres. 
Us volia recordar també que a les 9 i quart els que vulguin veure l'obra de Copenhague, que com veieu és l'única obra que té físics d'actors, no, d'actors no, de personatges, i que realment està molt bé, és la gran discussió de Bohr i de Heisenberg. I també us volia recordar que el diumenge hi haurà una lliçó donada per Lisa Randall, que és una catedràtica de Harvard, que es va especialitzar en teoria de cordes i coses molt properes. I per concloure, m'agradaria molt que li donem les gràcies al Philip Ball, que s'ha vingut des d'Anglaterra, que dintre poc ja no serà Europa, no? I aleshores no serà tan fàcil. I'm just joking that you're about to leave Europe. No, me personally. I wish you the... I would have parlat això del teu país, sortir a Europa, no? I moltes gràcies per la seva presència. Gràcies. Gràcies.